Hello, my name is Kurt, and I'm going to be talking to you about React, Redux, and Webpack. This will be a series of video based on a talk I gave a couple months ago. This first video will be general background about JavaScript frameworks and what makes React a little bit different. Then, in subsequent videos, we will be making a to-do list app, everybody's favorite app, using React, and then we'll be adding Redux to handle state and throughout we will be learning about Webpack, JSX, Babel, and some other tools that allow us to write in React and make beautiful web apps. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is why do we use frameworks? So when the internet first came about, <clears throat> a lot of websites were content-based, meaning there was text, uh, and there were images, and when someone clicked on something, say a button to go to another page or to do something, there was a request to the server, and there was, um, the server responded uh, based on the data from the request with a, new, a whole new page, so new HTML and CSS. Uh, but in between here, the page would, would reload. Uh, and so you'd get a blank screen and then a new page. This was fine when a lot of the internet was content-based. A good example of this is Wikipedia, actually. But as uh, web apps matured and people started using uh, mobile devices more, they expected a more dynamic app-like experience. And the issue with this server request and response cycle is that every time something happens or needs to change, the page needs to be reloaded completely, which is just not a great user experience users expected things to happen dynamically while they were on the page. So the alternative was when a user uh, requested a page from a server, the server would uh, send down HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And this is what's considered a single page application, meaning all of the content needed to run the page is sent down all at once, and once the JavaScript loads, it allows um, the programmer to write uh, and interact with the DOM and allows the user to experience a more dynamic web app. One of the um, challenges with a single page app is that instead of querying the server uh, for changes in uh, data, we need to send the data down to the client and then keep track of it over time. This x-axis is time. And so one of the main things that people talk about is handling state which is really just the data that comes down from the server. This could be data about the user, um, it could be the, the list of posts that are kind of drawn here. Um, it can also include stuff like UI state, user interaction state. So did the user click a button? Is the menu open or closed? There might be a toggle switch that users can disable something. Uh, a user may want to delete a post, and so we need to update it dynamically. Of course, we're still making server requests from our code because if a, ser if a user deletes a post, it needs to be updated on the server. But we also need to keep track of it on the client. And that's what people uh, talk about when they talk about keeping track of state. So one way to help us do this and to kind of um, standardize uh, the ways of writing code and handling the data and updating the DOM uh, is with the use of frameworks. So many of you have probably used maybe Backbone or Angular or you name it. And one thing that these frameworks have in common is this model view pattern. They might be an MVC, an MVVM, but ultimately many of these uh, use models and views. So here's our models. Um, these models are contain the data or the application state. Uh, generally, they are modularized, so this model might be user data, and this one might be posts or something like that uh, from the previous example. Now, these models are keeping track of the data. They might be making server calls and updating, uh, but the models are holding the data throughout the lifetime of the app on the client. The views are um, modules that are somehow attached to the models or are listening to the models. So in Backbone, these are event listeners. Uh, you might have a view that is uh, getting data when the model updates. And then the views are tightly coupled to the HTML. 
the views uh, are keeping track of what elements are being displayed. Um, they are changing it based on the models changing and, and what have you. One of the issues uh, with this setup is that we are still we are directly manipulating the DOM. We're touching the HTML. And one of the issues with this is that manipulating the DOM is expensive. It's slow and it's costly and generally we're probably not doing it in an efficient way. This is why if something changes here and only these two HTML elements need to know about it, we only update it through this view and update to this. We don't uh, want to reload any of this stuff or you know touch these. Now, in a small app like this, it's pretty easy to keep track of in your head. The problem is that uh, it's not this easy. And when an app grows, it becomes even harder. We might have more HTML elements. Um, we have we want to keep um, we want to handle user interactions, so we need arrows that go this way, and then views will then update the models. Uh, we, as our app grows and becomes more complicated, we realize that some of the user data uh, needs to know about maybe posts or maybe there's another model for UI state. And so these models talk to each other. We might add some HTML somewhere else. Uh, that makes sense because it's related to this view, but then all of a sudden it needs some data from this user. So we draw, draw an arrow. These arrows are probably bidirectional as well because views and users are, are updating the models in some way, such as maybe deleting a post like in our last example. And so the two main problems with this setup are we're manipulating the DOM, which is expensive, and we're probably not doing it efficiently and we're making a really complicated, we're creating a really complicated mental model around our data and our views. Uh, if there's a bug in the code somewhere, let's say here, uh, or more explicitly, we'd probably see it here, uh, where is it coming from? Well, it might be coming from a change in this model, which updates this model, which updates this view. Uh, it might have come from this new HTML element that we added, uh, and a user interaction updates this view, which updated this model, which updated this view. And these bugs become very hard to track down. And in fact, Facebook, who created React, uh, talk about an issue they had with their chat app where they had a bug in the header where they were having, um, where they displayed a notification of how many unread messages you had. And it was not being kept in sync with the chat app. And so they'd find this edge case and find what, what went wrong, and they'd fix it. But then a month later, there'd be another issue uh, that was exactly the same. The indicator in the header was not updating correctly with the actual number of unread messages. And so they wanted to rethink this whole model view um, paradigm, where you get a lot of circular dependencies and the mental model is really hard to keep track of. And they created React. So what does React look like in comparison to your typical model view paradigm? Well, it looks a lot simpler, first off, but I also drew it simply and don't have a bunch of crazy arrows going everywhere. So let's see what it is. React, are made up, React um, app is made up of components. These Cs stand for components. Uh, there are no bidirectional arrows, so arrows flow only one way. And because of this, the components form what is kind of like a tree structure. So these two components at this level are nested within this component, and then this component is nested uh, within this component here. One of the um, advantages of using React and this advantage solves the issue of manipulating the DOM uh, in an inefficient way, is that this blue box here is React. React abstracts, abstracts away the HTML. So when you write your code, you are never directly grabbing the HTML and updating it. React is doing that for you.
they have uh, what they call diffing algorithms to look at what needs to be updated over here. Uh, they update it, or they, they use the algorithm to figure out what needs to be updated, and then they update the specific HTML element that needs to be updated. So this solves the one problem of uh, not having to update the DOM yourself. So that's great. The other problem with the model view pattern was that it was hard to reason about. Your models were updating your views, which were updating your models in potentially circular patterns. Now, how does React deal with this? Well, it deals with it by having what's called unidirectional data flow. So these arrows are only pointing in one direction. These components are not updating components above them. Uh, so you don't lead to any circular dependencies uh, that are hard to reason about. Your application state, and we'll get more into this in future videos, is held above your components and whatever state is needed in components in sub in components below it are passed out. So you might be thinking, well, I'm still passing data into components, which seem to be like views. Uh, and then yeah, React's handling the HTML, but how is how how am I writing my code any differently than Backbone or say Angular? Well, what's cool that because React abstracts away the DOM over here, everything on this side is actually just JavaScript. Um, one of the, if I had to give one sentence of why I like using React, it's because it's just JavaScript. So when your app is running over here, it's running in what's called a virtual DOM. And it's just JavaScript. This means that updates can happen very fast. They happen so fast, in fact, that whenever any state changes, state again is your posts, your users, any data you're keeping track of, your UI state, React goes through all these down arrows and re-renders everything. It says, well, let's see what's changed. So the state's changed, let's pass it down and see what needs to change and be updated. And because React, because this is all JavaScript, it happens really fast. Wow, that was bad. This is all just JavaScript. Happens really fast. So every time state changes, React re-renders the entire app. And you don't have to worry about only finding the specific components that changed and only changing the HTML that needed to be changed because React's handling that for you. So what it means is, when you write your components, you expect that they will get the updated state whenever the state changes. And because of that, you can actually think of your components in a functional programming paradigm. You can think of them as a function that takes in state and outputs HTML-ish, what you want it to look like. So you, make, you write your components and you tell them what they should look like based on the state. And of course, this is React. And React's going to actually make the changes on the DOM, so you don't have to worry about it. The cool thing about this is that it's a declarative way of writing your code, as opposed to an imperative way. So these are big words, or should I say murky words. Let's see what they really mean, or what I mean when I say them. So imperative code is more like what you're used to with Backbone or Angular. Imperative code is um, how to do something. So with Backbone and Angular, when a model updates, you tell the view to listen to that model. And then in the view, you tell the HTML what to do. Change this way. Imperative coding is kind of like a laundry list of things. So as a simpler example, Let's say we want to loop over an array and we want to return, we want, we want to take an array and we want to return an array where every element is multiplied by two. With imperative coding, you would say one, take input array, two, loop over each element, three, multiply each element by two. Four, return new array. 
that's great. But every time you have an array and you want to do something, you have to rewrite all these steps. So the alternative to imperative programming is declarative programming. Declarative programming isn't the how to do something. Declarative is why. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not true. But I'm only off by one letter. It's what you want done. So with declarative, it means you're using some level of abstraction. So in this array example, we can use a library like underscore dot each. And if you're um, if you're not familiar with the underscore library, it's just a, uh, it's a helper library for JavaScript. Uh, and it allows you to write in a more functional programming type of way. So in this case, the dot each is abstracting away, taking an input, looping over, and returning it. And it leaves what you want done on each element up to you. And this is the what. All this stuff is the how. So with dot each, you just pass in a function. I'm going to use some cool ES6 syntax. And you would just say return You're giving it a function that's going to be passed in each value of the array, and you're just going to return val times 2. Another example of imperative and declarative. Uh, an imperative, let's say you're querying a database and you need to find a users of a certain category. You would pull out all the users, loop through them, find the ones that match the, the category, and return them. Declarative is like SQL language, uh, where you can just say a statement, select, you know, star from users where category is this. And the SQL language abstracts away all of the how you loop through and pull out of the database and just gives you what you want. So to go back to this example, Sorry. React is abstracting away the DOM. And so you never have to go in and pull out an HTML element to update its text or update its color or something like that. You write your components that you write your components as a function of state. And again, state is going to be re-rendered every time, or the app is going to be re-rendered every time, and state's going to be passed down. And you output what it's supposed to look like. And we'll get more into uh, exactly how we do that. Uh, but first, let me show you uh, a quick example that'll be easier with, uh, with the presentation I had given a few months ago. So here you see uh, a very similar setup to what I have written down. Um, but we went ahead of ourselves. Here we have our component tree and our app state being passed down to the components. We have React abstracting away the DOM. I said each component is basically a function that takes in state and returns what it should look like. So here is the render function. Every component has a render function. We're returning a div. We'll get more into the syntax in another video. And we're saying the div should say text and the color. We're inline styling it with a color attribute should be based on a function of this.state.color. So if here our color is black, we see our text is black. But let's say a user clicks something or we get a server call that changes the color to blue. This gets passed down to the component. The component is written declaratively based on that state. And so React will uh, re-render the app, see that the component has changed. React will find the minimal changes that need to be changed. And if you're looking right here, boom. And it happens really fast, and it's really fun. So that's the general background of how React works. Uh, in my next video, uh, I'll be setting up a simple um, structure of a React app. Uh, we'll learn a little bit about how Webpack works uh, to help you build your React app. And uh, we'll start making a to-do list.